to be a champion. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a vision of greatness and dare to make that particular vision known. Good morning. Again, my name is Ron Archer, and I'm an industrial psychologist, and I've spent the last 15 years of my professional career helping National Football League coaches, players, corporate trainers, corporate executives to recognize that when a paradigm changes, that either we are on the way taking advantage of that change, or that we are in the way becoming victims of that change. In our short, short time together this morning, we're going to talk about how to be able to achieve what is known as peak performance under peak pressure. I want you to know I've been trained in the school of public speaking called Stand Up, Speak Up, and Then Shut Up, so we'll get the process underway. To recognize that champions have the capability to be able to motivate others to achieve outstanding performance and even find ways to pull victory out of the jaws of defeat. My friends, we want to stress the difference today between casual involvement with something and personal commitment. Huge difference. You see, my friends, casual involvement and personal commitment are very similar to ham and eggs. Well, how so? That's a strange analogy. Well, with ham and eggs, the chicken was casually involved. The pig was personally committed. <laughs> One could lay and walk away, and one was there to stay. <laughs> People often ask me as an industrial psychologist, Ron, what do you really do? We go to South Africa, we work with all kinds of sports teams and champions in many areas, surgeons, and I basically say that as a motivational trainer, as an industrial psychologist, we primarily do this. We try to comfort the disturbed, and then we try to disturb the comfortable to find new ways to make outstanding performance a reality in an organization and to be able to achieve peak performance under peak pressure. Before I start, I want to give you what I call a psychological listening test. If you will, please, take out a blank sheet of paper. You have some pads around you, and I'd like you to give this test the world. How well do you listen? Great coaches, great leaders, great champions have the ability to separate fact from fiction, myth from reality, and have the capability to listen adroitly. How well do you listen? What I'd like you to do, please, on that blank sheet of paper is to number that paper from one to seven vertically, up and down, not across, one to seven vertically. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. When you have that done, please, at the bottom of that paper, print out your full name. We may understand that this is your paper and no one else's. This is your listening capability. How well do you listen? Now, my friends, the first six of these are going to be questions. I'm going to ask them only one time. So please, listen as you carefully can and write down what you believe is the correct response. Number seven is not going to be a question. It is going to be an old cliche that I'm going to dress up in pedantic nomenclature and intellectual academic jargon, try to confuse you, but being great listeners, you'll be able to write down, what is this man really trying to say? How well do you listen? Let's find out right now. Number one, please. First question. A man builds an ordinary house with four sides. Each side has a southern exposure. A bear comes to the door and rings the doorbell. What color is the bear? Number one, how well do you listen? No talking, please. Just listen and write down what you believe is the correct response. Write something down. Follow your instincts. What color is the bear? Number two, you're in a dark, damp cave with only one match. You have a kerosene lamp an oil lantern, and a wood-burning stove. Which do you light first to achieve maximum heat? Number two, how well do you listen? Number three, how many animals of each species did Moses take aboard the ark before the great flood? Number three. 
Number four, is there any federal law against the man marrying his widow's sister? Number four. Number five, an archaeologist claims that she's dug up a coin that is clearly dated 46 B.C. Why is this person not telling the truth? Number five. And now number six, it is 4th of July, and we have Independence Day. Fireworks are exploding people having barbecues in the backyard. And the question arises, is there a 4th of July over in England? Now that's a gimme, that's a freebie to encourage at least one right answer on your paper, at least one. <laughs> we do have a heart at the Archer Institute. And last but not least, now number seven, remember now this is not a question but an interpretation. I want you to write down the simplest terms. What is this man really trying to say? Number seven, a feathered vertebrae enclosed in the grasping organ has an estimated worth that it's higher than dual encapsulated in the branched shrub. In the simplest terms, write down what is this man really trying to say? How well do you listen? Take some time, write it down now. Check your paper again for accuracy and quality and thoroughness to make certain that that represents your listening capabilities. Check it over once more. All right, and you have it done? Exchange your papers with a neighbor. Somebody sitting around you. Oh, come on now. The old honor system. You know about this thing and insurance. Honor, credibility, consistency. All right, let's see how well we did. Number one, a man builds an ordinary house with four sides. Each side has a southern exposure. A bear comes through the door and rings the doorbell. What color is the bear? The bear is white. Very good. All four sides facing south must be due north. Polar bear, the answer is white. Very good. Number two, deductive listening. Number two, what do you like first? to achieve maximum heat in this dark, damp cave. You must light the match. Very good. Everything else there needs an ignition source. You gotta light the match first. Now for the easy one. Number three, how many animals of each species aboard this ark before the great flood? How many? Zero. I said, how many did Moses take aboard the ark? Oh, you knew that now. It wasn't Moses, it was Noah. Noah. Moses had the Ten Commandos. Noah had the animals. <laughs> Number four, is there any federal law against the man marrying his widow's sister? The answer, of course, is no, because if he has a widow, where's he? Like to see him do it, he can't do anything. Who cares? It's irrelevant. Mute point. Number five, an archaeologist claims that she's dug up a coin that is clearly dated 46 B.C. Why is this person not telling the truth? Why? Because they did not know in 46 B.C. that they were in 46 B.C. They didn't call things B.C. to sometime in A.D. called post-dating. And number six, is there a 4th of July over in England? Of course, on the Julian calendar, a 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th. And I know you got that one. That's a given. I know that. <laughs> they have barbecues? No, but they do have the date on the calendar. And last but not least, number seven, a feathered vertebrae enclosed in the grasping organ has an estimated worth and it's higher than duo encapsulated in the branched shrub. The old saying, of course, simply is... A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. All right, get your papers back now. Let's see how we did. I wonder how the kids did, those that are still here, those great listeners. All right, let's find out. All those who got seven correct, please stand. Let's see who you are. Come on, stand up. Let's see them now, all seven. 
Hey, give them a hand. Come on now. All right. How many got just six correct? Would you raise your hands? Those that have six, okay. We'll give you what is called in the industry a Wimbledon. <laughs> and how many will never tell? <laughs> I feel your pain. How can we today, as the best and the brightest in this room, with your peak performance under peak pressure, how can we maintain the vision, the energy, the passion to make champions both of ourselves continuously and champions of those around us? The question must be then, my friends, why do we need champions today? Why do we need people that can find ways to pull victory out of the jaws of defeat and make certain that those around them, they raise the tide of those around them? John Kennedy wrote these words about champions, and I quote, he said, We have come over on different ships, but that we're in the same boat now. We either learn to work together as friends or perish as fools, for a high tide will raise all of our ships. And that is the challenge of champions. They're not just great themselves, but they find innovative ways to raise the tide of all those around them to be able to achieve what is called peak performance under peak pressure. They're good, but they make those around them even better. Why do we need champions? My friends, Dr. Peter Drucker, who I believe is the most profound writer in America today, on organizational challenges and change, professor at Harvard University, president of the Drucker Institute, wrote these words about American institutions, and I quote, he said that the average American institution today in the 90s, as we face the year 2000, is facing the three C's of overwhelming complexity of increasing competition and of accelerated tumultuous change that if American organizations are going to be able to achieve peak performance under peak pressure and find some new way to gain what is called a global competitive advantage, there must be, in many cases, my friends, a philosophical break with the past. That one of the greatest barriers to future success is our past success. What a paradox we have to deal with, that one of the greatest barriers to future innovation, to future breakthroughs, is our past success. Assuming what has made us great up till today, what has made us successful up to now, will automatically carry us through when there are continued changes in our environment. How do we maintain the championship banner in the midst of change, with complexity, competition, with accelerated growth, all the complexities and the vicissitudes of change, how can we as champions maintain that fire and help those around us see that opportunity and find ways to say, who cares if the horse is blind? Load the wagon, we can make it. Or have them say, let's get in the rowboat, let's chase Shamu and bring the tartar sauce with you. We're gonna have lunch today. That's what we need today. We need, my friends, champions who understand they must be in the 90s paradigm pioneers that see the opportunity to find innovative ways to bring about accelerated revenue growth and find new ways to win in spite of change. My friends, I've learned in my years of consulting and coaching with football players and surgeons and pilots that change will never leave you like it found you. Change will either make you better or it'll make you bitter. The choice is absolutely yours. There are three kinds of people in the world that deal with change. Those that are determined to make it happen, those that sit back passively and watch it happen, and those that walk around in a daze saying, what happened? <laughs> what happened to the revenue? What happened to the customers? What happened? 
when a paradigm changes, when the rules of the game change, when customer expectations change, either we're going to be on the way, taking advantage of it, or in the way being crushed. There is no in-between. Vince Lombardi used to say to his team, it is easy to be ordinary. It is easy to be average. But it takes courage, commitment, conviction, and consistency to excel. Why do we need champions? Not just for today, but for years to come. My friends, the forces of competition globally, America hasn't gotten worse. The world has simply caught up with us since World War II. It's now a global marketplace. The forces of competition, my friends, and the epidemic of quality have increased almost exponentially the supervisory span of control in America. Pressure. Ten years ago, the average span of control for a frontline American supervisor was basically one to seven. For every one manager, you had seven people you had to motivate, you had to instill wisdom in, you had to have a vision for these people. Today, that has grown almost exponentially from one to seven to one to 25. As American organizations facing global competitive pressures began to shrink themselves vertically and grow horizontally, the supervisory span of control in America is continually growing. You've heard the terminology, do more with less. They call it many things. Some people call it downsizing. Some call it right-sizing. Some call it re-engineering. They call it in California, we're going to bring you in and free up your future. But I've learned that champions find a way to thrive and survive in spite of constant change. They're not fearful, they're bold, they're courageous, they're open-minded, they look and they view, they analyze and they find ways to pull victory every time. Look at great performance. Michael Jordan years ago was a, what we call, go-to-the-hoop player. He played above the rim. He played dunking, reversing, slamming. That was his style of play. His coach said, Michael, you got to change. He said, why? This is working for me. I'm a great guy in the hoop, slamming and jamming. He said, Michael, one day your legs won't be there. Learn now. Even while you're successful slamming and jamming, learn how to play a perimeter game. Learn how to shoot. Learn how to pass. He says your past success will limit you in the future. Change your game. Work on shooting the ball. Work on passing. And he said you'll be greater if you learn how to score less. And your teammates can score more. Well, four championships later, we see how that champion adapted to change. Became a great outside shooter, a great passer, and made those around him even better. Champions are adaptable. My friends, the predictions are of the year 2003, the average span of control in American organization will rise from 1 to 25 to 1 to 65. In Japan, it's 1 to 150. Champions as paradigm pioneers. Secondly, my friends, we need champions because we have to find new ways to move beyond the old paradigm of customer satisfaction. That's been our past success. That's been our pedantic nomenclature, our jargon, our verbiage for years that we are here as an organization to achieve what is called customer satisfaction. My friends, I'm here to tell you that that's no longer acceptable. Not in a day of tremendous complexity, competition, and change. Satisfaction is almost like an oxymoron, like jumbo shrimp, icy hot. It doesn't make sense. As a psychologist, I study how words impact what is called the reticular activating system, how it causes people to perform or find ways to self-destruct under pressure. What does the word satisfaction actually mean? Think about it now. For years, we go back through our educational processes 
and go back and reflect on your grade school report card. Remember those very important pieces of paper that held the balance of power in your life? Those report card days were very important days. We call them in psychology significant emotional experiences. Because during that day, when you got that manila envelope and you would get that piece of paper, some kids were so frightened that they would say to their friends, here, let's exchange. Let me look at yours. I'll look at it. Don't, don't tell me. Let me see it later. <laughs> Every letter grade on that report card, especially the extreme grades, produced an emotional response. If you saw all A's, on that report card, you went berserk because A stood for what? A stood for? You walked on water. Kiss yourself. Mwah. You could go home with power. You walk in the door with a swagger. <laughs> What's up, pups? Ma, how you doing? What's wrong with you? Hey, look. Can we say bike? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Oh my goodness, they got straight A's. They call up the neighbors, they call up the priest, the pastor, old friend, grandma. Guess what? We have a genius in the family. He has my genetic code. You bring home bees? Hey, good effort. Triple in the park. And don't bring home, D, D, D's for dumb. No, no, not a D. And please, we knew we didn't want to go home if we got the flag. <laughs> not the patriotic one, the red one. F. When kids saw that, it just took their energy away, walked in the house, put it somewhere. And a couple days later, the parent found it. When the parent saw the F, it took the wind out of them. Yeah. You, 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 you got an F? Did, did you show up? You don't have a job. All you have to do is go and sit and learn a little. F means total lack of effort. Oh, no, no, no. But then there was this mysterious grade, this existential, esoteric grade we called C. The C grade was almost tasteless like air. <laughs> Parents didn't know what to do with the sea. They just kind of walked away. You got to see. You know, they, I, I don't want to discourage them, but... And what did that letter C stand for? Give me some words now. You remember, C stood for average, fair, or satisfactory that the student did just enough to meet a preset standard to pass. No dean's list, no scholarships, no honor roll, just enough to pass. If it's so satisfactory, why then in graduate school you get two C's, they ask you to leave. And yet we will pronounce to people all over the company, all over the world, we are here to achieve customer satisfaction. People know what that means. It means do just enough to meet a preset standard to pass or do just enough to shut somebody up. But as you well know, by being here this day, that satisfaction isn't enough. My friends, the new paradigm today is something called customer delight. Not satisfaction. In a competitive, ever-changing world, we have to start delighting people today. Tom Peters calls it the pursuit of the wow experience. 
Wow, what a client. Wow, what an organization. Wow, what service. Or as Kim Blanchard calls it, we have to turn customers into raving fans. Because a fan base will sell and grow your business more than any advertising, more than anything you can do. Having fans who brag about you, their friends, church members, all those who talk to you, you got to go there. You got to talk to these people. They're fantastic. They're great. You do the same thing. You see a great movie, you tell folks about it. You see a, drive a great car, you brag about it. But the reverse is true too. If you are disappointed or it's just, oh, it's okay, they get the message. Saturn Corporation understands fans, this little geeky car that has a following. It's scary. <laughs> These people walk around and they say, look at my wallet, picture of my car. Saturn, see? They have revivals and picnics in Tennessee. They pass out cookies. Next year, you're going to Disney World, Orlando. They understand fans. Now, when I go to Disney, I have four children, three boys and one girl, just four. And my house is teetering on destruction. I go to Disney World, 400,000 kids are there, diapers hanging, noses running, popcorn falling, cotton candy flying, and the place is spotless. They have all these people around, friendly, in disguise. I know that some are just trees. They sweep up and they stand back in the tree. It has to be that way. It has to be. <laughs> it's an amazing place. And then you have everybody. We saw Mickey and Minnie today. Well, they go to Disney World. They have that black top. It's 125 degrees, 99 percent humidity, and everybody's happy. <laughs> you wouldn't want me in that suit. <laughs> Welcome. It's hot! <laughs> but they have a mindset there. That is, you're not just a customer. They call you a guest. That's a mindset. Some organizations view us as pests, not guests. And people know that. We have to work on continuously achieving delight. Under-promising, over-delivering. Even the fastest growing city in America understands customer delight. It is the city of Las Vegas. Psychologically, Vegas should not be. The average person goes to Vegas and loses $500 a trip. They don't come back. <laughs> I've been to Vegas and I lost 500. They come back. I've been to Vegas. Lost 500. It was great. I'm going back next year. Somebody help me with that. Perplexing. An enigma. Wrapped up in a riddle. I have a friend that says, I'm going back to visit my money. I built two hotels there. <laughs> but Vegas wants to wow you. It's in a desert. It has volcanoes erupting, palm trees running, laser beams shooting, amusement park. They want you to say, wow. And they know if they wow you consistently with cheap food, Buffets everywhere. Even now they have mist on the sidewalks to keep you cool as you walk to spend more money. They want you to say, wow, and become a fan base. Are you creating fans? Are you turning those customers into fans with your great performance? with your integrity character, with your consistency, are you a champion? Yes, you're here. That speaks for itself. 
but let's make others in the organization champions as well and raise that tide. Let's have not just 500, let's have 5,000. And my friends, what makes a champion? We have studied great performers in our lives. We've seen the great Cassius Clay Muhammad Ali. We have watched Nancy Lopez make that wonderful putt under pressure. What makes a champion? In my years of analyzing great performance, I want to give you five key elements that I think separate the winners from the whiners, the contenders from the pretenders, and the champs from the chumps. Five basic skill sets that we have learned that really allow people to become champions and then make those around them champions. Number one, we discovered that champions have a powerful vision of themselves and of their lives. They have a vision that is so meaningful and so sincere, it motivates those around them and compels them to excellence. We hear this term all the time now, vision. We hear it in boardrooms with football coaches, with surgeons. What does it mean for the common person trying to excel in a very changing marking place? Defined academically basically means this. Vision is having the ability with tremendous power and clarity to be able to describe to others a preferred future state and then to create an environment that empowers people to create that future state. That's called vision. Or to boldly call forth those things that be not as though it were. To describe the future state with such clarity that people are motivated to achieve it. Margaret Thatcher wrote these words about vision. I quote her. She said, I cannot change the past. There are people in my government who can manage the present. She said, it is my unique responsibility as a leader of this nation to shine a very bright spotlight into the future and then to allow my people to create that future. That's called visionary leadership. George Bernard Shaw wrote these words about vision. I quote him and he wrote, he said, you see things as they are now and you ask why. He said, I dream things that never were and I ask. Why not? Dr. Martin Luther King in his profound book, The Strength to Lead and to Love, wrote these words about vision, and I quote, he said, if a group of people have not found at least one thing for good, they're willing to stand on, work for, and defend, that group is not fit to lead. For either we shall stand for something or fall for anything. Vision. And my friends, even Henry Ford wrote it best when he said about vision, whether if you think you can or whether if you think you cannot, either way, you are absolutely right that your attitude will determine your altitude and your perspective will determine your performance. And my friends, even Helen Keller understood vision. Now that is a paradox, you know the story. Helen Keller was both deaf and blind. She could not see, she could not hear. She was even labeled by her parents to be what is called educationally mentally retarded, unable to learn. They wanted to put her away. But someone with vision saw that there was so much in this young girl that could come out. She didn't believe the labels. She didn't believe all the stories. She simply had a preferred future state for this young lady. And she worked with her. And in her mind, instead of a breakdown, she always saw a marvelous breakthrough. And through the hand-touch method, Helen went on to earn her master's degree in special education being both deaf and blind. A reporter from Time Life magazine was at her graduation, just overwhelmed by her capabilities to have resiliency and being persistent, and simply asked Helen this question. He said, Helen, through the hand touch method, is there anything worse than not being able to see? And Helen said in her own witty way, absolutely. To be able to see, she said, and have absolutely no vision. That without vision, she said, we become like blind men, 
in dark rooms chasing black cats who simply are not there. Spending our time, she said, confusing activity with accomplishment. How many groups do you know that are busy being busy, and yet they're confusing activity with accomplishment? They spend times in meetings where minutes are kept, but hours are lost because there is no common sense of destiny. Don't underestimate the power of being a visionary champion. Because my friends, vision changed my life. Today is a dream come true for me. It absolutely is. I dreamed of doing this kind of thing when I was a kid. My idols were people like John Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, the Mohandas, and being able to help others in a positive way. But absolutely no one would have believed that I would be here this day doing this activity with you wonderful people, except one visionary person. I'll tell you why. When I was a kid growing up in the inner cities of Cleveland, I was a severe stutterer. I had a tremendous speech impediment as a kid. And talk about shame growing up and low self-esteem. I lived it every day. When I was in school, I dreaded getting up to have to recite something on the board. It was horrible for me because my stuttering was, I would jerk and I would move and I couldn't get things out. And it was so embarrassing that my friends in school had a poem about me. You know, kids can be when you have a problem sometimes. They don't mean to do harm, they're just innocent having fun, but my problem was so severe, they used to sing a song about me during recess or in the restrooms, the song would be, his name is Renardo, he is a retardo. He sits on the steeple, when he talks, watch out, he'll spit at the people. And talk about total shame and low self-esteem. I was called in the fourth grade an at-risk student this young man might not make it. But having a visionary champion changed my life. My mother was a visionary. I don't know where she got it from. I really don't. She's not educated. She grew up in just terrible poverty. One of seven kids, had to leave school, work a job, help support the family, had me when she was 17 years of age. My first cradle was not a cradle, it was a dresser drawer. Potatoes was our menu every day. Potato pancakes, potato soup, potato fritters, potato, whatever you could make out of potatoes, we made it. With all of that poverty, all the rats and the roaches and the degradation, somehow my mother was an optimist. With no education, one of seven, working hard, she believed that in America, if you got a good education, worked hard, you could become anything you wanted to be. And she believed that. She was the kind of person that if she saw a pile of manure, she would get a shovel, start smiling and say, come on and help, there's a pony here somewhere. <laughs> and here I was, her only son. She had so many dreams for me, hopes for me. And here I was in the fourth grade, struggling, starting to hate school and hating myself. We couldn't afford a speech pathologist. We didn't have that kind of resources. So my mom said always to me, there never are chains on the libraries. There's all kinds of information there. She was self-taught, read all the time. Books, books, books were in the house. And so she began to research, stuttering herself, reading about it. We discovered some very interesting people were stutterers who overcame it. People like the voice behind Darth Vader, Luke. I'm your father, Luke. And the voice behind CNN, this is CNN. Well, we discovered that was James Earl Jones, who was a severe stutterer growing up and developing, who was Othello, all the Shakespearean actor. And we began to discover that these people had certain traits they worked on, and she bought an old tape recorder with an old microphone, big old thing. We would sit down every day after dinner, and she made me work on some stupid phrases, phrases like, the sea ceaseth and it sufficeth us and proper preparation prevents poor performance and possible punitive punishment. I hated it. Being a stutterer, I was there all night. 
and she was demanding. So months went by, even years went by, and I didn't see much improvement. So one day, getting a little older, getting a little bit more, you know, rebellious, I said, Mom, I'm not going to do this stupid stuff anymore. It's not working. Just face it. I'm not going to do this well. And Mom sat there in her chair. Didn't say anything. That was dangerous. <laughs> and then she sprang up and she grabbed me by the collar pulled me across the table through the food and said, listen, boy, learn this now about life, that anything in life worth doing is worth doing poorly at first until you master it. Life is hard. You got to do things hard because the person on top of the mountain did not fall there. She says, I see, I read your writings. The way you write, if we can ever get you to speak this stuff, you don't speak it well now, but I see it, so help me God. One day she said, they're going to pay you to talk. <laughs> you know how mothers are. And here's my mom, this visionary lady. And we worked at this thing, and we worked at this thing, and today because of her vision, we now have 45 full-time people, offices in New York, Cleveland, L.A., our first book cutting the bookstore, doing Oprah Winfrey in a couple weeks. Here we have offices getting in South Africa. Here we have all kinds of training seminars, all because of somebody who had a sense of vision and refused to compromise. About three months ago, we almost lost her. My mom always worked, had a very strong work ethic. And she was working as a teller in a bank in downtown Cleveland. She was robbed at gunpoint, and we almost lost her. I had been begging her for years to retire and come join the Institute. And her response always was, well, no, baby, I don't want to be a burden. <laughs> Mom, you're not a burden. After the incident, I went to her and I said, Mom, please. That everything we have is because of you. Abraham Lincoln, young people, he wrote these words. Don't forget this. He said, all that I am and all that I ever hope to be, I owe to my parents. I bet on my hands and knees. I said, Mom, come home. She worked cleaning toilets. And my vision was one thing, to make my mom proud of me. She was the only person who believed. And I said, Mom, come home. And I can proudly say now, Mom retired from her banking job. She's joined the Institute, and now she's vice president or whatever she wants to be. <laughs> My friends, here's the idea about vision. People first must believe that you believe before they'll ever believe. Mahatma Gandhi wrote these words about champions or visions. He said that you cannot teach what you do not know. And you cannot lead where you are not willing to go. Meaning, you can't fake it till you make it. The way that a vision takes hold in people's lives is because you have passion about it. Passion, that is what brings a vision to life. The energy, the enthusiasm, the contagious excitement. Because you believe in this thing so much, you talk about it, you read about it every day, every day. It's, it's contagious. And people catch what you have. After vision, my friends, develop the confidence to step out on it. Be confident about it. Don't be afraid. Of course it's going to be difficult. Of course some people won't, won't believe in it. Of course some will doubt it. You have, whenever you launch out, 
Many of you have your own firms, own agencies. You want to grow, and there are people saying, oh, you can't do that. Oh, this is not going to happen. Well, we don't have the resources. We don't have the client base. Visionaries are on the edge. They call forth those things that be not as though they were. They see it, and with their passion, they bring it to pass because of their confidence in it and in themselves. They will it to happen. They find ways. They talk to people. They share information. Whenever you launch a new vision, recognize that the population who's listening to you will fall into three basic camps, either at your organization, in your community, in your... It doesn't matter. People fall in what's called organizational behavior. When you launch a change, a new idea, to say we're going to boldly go where no team has gone before, people will fall into three basic camps. 20, 60, 20. 20% 20 will agree with you. They'll see it too. They'll be so, maybe your spouse, your family, friends, they will say, yes, you can do this. Is it hard? Absolutely. But it's supposed to be hard. It separates the winners from the whiners. They're there to help you, support you, see it. Then you have another 20% who are absolutely toxic. We call this group the toxic people. They are there to sabotage, rain on the parade. Oh, you can't do it. They're not going to buy from you. You don't have this. It's not going to work. Doomsday, doomsday. It's not, we're going to die if you try that. <laughs> and they just cast doubt and doubt and doubt. You can't do it. It's not going to work. We can't make it happen. No, 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 no. All the time. Now, listen, we all have doubt sometimes, but not every day. That's not normal. And you can even say, okay, look, look, the sun is out. Rejoice, the sun has come out. And they'll go, yeah, but it causes cancer, Mr. Happy. You're still going to die. <laughs> Toxic, sour. And if you allow them, they will talk you out of it every time. And then you'll wind up being what is called a woulda, coulda, shoulda. Oh, I could have been. I should have been. Don't you dare let somebody talk you out of your dream and vision. This is America with hard work, faith in God, with some kind of resilience and persistence. I've lived it. Anything is possible. Then you have 60% who are waiting to be led by you. They're not convinced. They're not doubters. They're just waiting. Focus on that 80% and what they will do in time with your enthusiasm, your success, they'll drag in. If they can't draw them in, they'll find ways to drive them out. That's what separates the winners from the whiners. Vision, confidence. Thirdly, you got to communicate the vision. You got to communicate it. You got to communicate it every day. You got to talk about it. You got to sing about it. You got to spread it out. You got to talk, talk, talk. It's called TTP, talk to people. If that doesn't work, TTMP, talk to more people. But understand one thing. It's not the words you say. You are the message. You, not the words you communicate, not, the, not all the fancy nomenclature. People are looking to you. My friends, you can barely push people across the street, but you can lead them around the world. The old saying has been, well, Ron, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink, but you can make them thirsty. That's the job of a champion. Communicate with passion, from the heart, with sincerity, with belief. Understand that only 7% of the meaning of the message is transmitted by your words. When it comes to motivating others and inspiring others and working with others, only 7% of the actual message is transmitted by the words. 38% is by the tone of voice and 55% is by the body language. Be the message. Communicate it with clarity. Fourthly, my friends, be consistent. Be consistent with what you do. People don't care how much you know, but they know how much you care. And lastly, my friends, have the courage to do it.
not talk about it, not think about it, to do it. Building a successful organization long term is like trying to grow the most difficult tree in the world to grow, called the Chinese bamboo tree. A farmer will take a seed and put it in the ground and spend one full year watering the seed, fertilizing the soil, and after one full year, look out and see nothing for his or her labor. You think that's bad? Well, years two, years three, years four are the exact same way. Can you imagine now putting a seed in the ground and spending time there fertilizing and watering every day and seeing nothing for your labor? Sometimes breakthroughs are the exact same way. Because during the first three months of the fifth year, that seed that was dormant grows into a tree that was 90 feet tall. And the question becomes, did it grow 90 feet in three months, or did it grow 90 feet in five years? The answer is obvious. Because during those first four years, when people saw no major growth, the farmer with wisdom knew that that seed was growing a root base underground that could support a trunk that would grow 90 feet in three months. Vision. The tree that never had to fight for its share of air, sky, land, water, or light, never became a forest king, but lived and died a scrubby thing. A man who never has to fight for his share of air, sky, land, water, or light, never becomes a disciplined man, but lives and dies as he began. Good timber does not grow with ease. The stronger the winds, the tougher the trees. If you can't be the pine on the top of the hill, then be a shrub in the valley, but be the best shrub on the side of the rail. If you can't be the highway, be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star, but then it's not by size you win or you fail, because then you are the absolute best of what it is that you are. You're here today, come back next year, and next year, and next year, and build a team, and understand that the person, the team, the organization, on top of the mountain did not fall there. God bless you. Thank you for your time.